You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Vanessa Scotto, and shortly we'll be joined by my co-host, Brooke Thomas. On Bliss and Grit, we're having conversations about being students on the embodied spiritual path. We're exploring everything to do with the human journey, and most especially, how do we stay open to embracing everything in this world? The beauty, the pain, the joy, the chaos, the bliss, and the grit. Since we'll be having so many conversations and we'll be sharing so much personally as the podcast goes on, we thought it'd be fun for the first couple of episodes to do interviews with each other so you could really get to know us and have an idea of where we're coming from when we share our point of view. In last week's episode, Brooke interviewed me, and I'm hoping that you got a chance to get to know me a little bit better and understand what makes me tick. And in today's episode, I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing my dear longtime friend, Brooke Thomas. Brooke is an amazing woman with a penchant for evolution, and I'm hoping you'll have as much fun listening as I did interviewing her as you get to know kind of where she's coming from, what her practice was, and really where she's at today on her own personal journey. Just a note before we dive into the interview, Brooke and I have a habit of sometimes using potty language when we really get rolling. So if there are any kids around, you may want to pop in some headphones and otherwise just be prepared for a moment or two of poor language. I'm going to go ahead and introduce my friend and my co-podcaster, Brooke Thomas. Maybe you heard our podcast last week where Brooke shared the story of how we first met about 15 years ago now at a wellness center in Brooklyn, New York. Brooke is a rolfer, a movement educator, and one of the biggest body nerds I know who's been helping people find joy and ease in their body for over a decade now. To me, she's a real impressive force for body health in her industry, but I want to let you get to know Brooke a little more, get that inside track so you see her a little closer to the way I see her. Brooke's actually one of the most creative people out there. When I first met Brooke, she was almost, she was a rolfer and then almost half her time was still dedicated to art. She's really at heart an artist and she loves getting a vision and then building it from the ground up. This includes her beloved podcast, A Deliberated Body. Some of you may know her from that. She's also a woman of true integrity, which means a lot to me. I think one of the things that Brooke and I both value so much is people who walk their talk, people who are willing to push their own limits with grace and resiliency before they show up and just hand out a bunch of cheap and easy advice. One of the things I love most about Brooke is even though she's had her fair share of stress in life, Brooke is one of the most delighted and delightful people that I know. She is always ready to make me laugh. And sometimes you'll find her randomly breaking out dancing when she hears a good beat. (laughs) The little inside secret, Brooke's got a penchant for dark comedies, which we share and an unfortunate habit of running comedy memes through her head while meditating. All of these things and more make me feel grateful to have Brooke both as a friend and my podcast partner in crime. And by now, I am sure that Brooke is blushing and eager for me to end this, so (laughs) I will stop yammering. And I'll turn the mic over. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Vanessa. I'm so, so honored by everything you said. Thank you. <laughs> I stammered my way through it, but there we go. We. That's how it, that's how it is when you're interviewing your bestie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Brooke, uh, let's start kind of at the beginning, quote unquote. I just told everybody you've been a practitioner and you've been a voice for embodiment and for health for a long time now. And I think it's useful to start off telling everybody a bit about your own personal journey. So let's begin with just why did you choose to become a rolfer? What was the personal impetus for you? Yeah. um, It's so interesting. Like when there's, when there's a story, like the background story, 
um, trying really to come from a fresh place instead of playing back the recording, right? Because mm. so I've been a rolfer for almost 16 years. And I get that question a lot, even just from clients. I get that question from people who listen to my show, Liberated Body. Um, why are you in the field? So I say it a lot. So I'm going to try not to just um, push play on a tape, keep it a little fresh. Um, so I, when I was born, I had a birth injury, which is I don't know, fairly mysterious in a certain sense. Uh, we know that I had the cord wrapped around my neck, although supposedly the medical records didn't show that I had oxygen deprivation. Um, I did have facial paralysis on the right side, could have been Bell's palsy. Nobody used that word until I was older, you know, so it's one of those things. And then I did develop um, seizures when I was, well, that's not true. Seizures got noticed when I was 10 <laughs> and it seemed like it was news to everyone but me. <laughs> So I probably always had them. They're petite mal, which hmm. uh, for those who aren't familiar means they're non-convulsive. So they're not the uh, super obvious dramatic kind. So it started in school with my teachers thinking that I had a hearing problem because I would just be staring into space and they wouldn't be able to get me back or get my attention. So it started mm -hmm. with um, checking my hearing. And uh, then what happened was that one Christmas Eve, I had a seizure and fell into the Christmas tree. <laughs> so... That was the moment where my parents were like, something is up. Um, mm -hmm. And that began the process of of neurologists and all that stuff. But I do remember, like, if I can go back to that part of my brain when I was 10, that it it didn't feel like something new was happening to me. It felt like the rest of the world was pointing out something to me. And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> like, mm, it's interesting. That's a thing. And I was like that with pain, too. So, I, I grew up with... Um, chronic pain. And, you know, the doctors that I had in my life were pretty much neurologists through the years and lots of testing for that and, and stuff like that. And I would bring up the pain that I had, which localized a lot in my um, jaw and my head and my spine and my sacroiliac joints. So really that axial, you know, central part of me. And it got really blown off a lot because I was a child as growing pains, uh, which really bums me out. If I ever have parents call me in my practice to work with their child who has pain, I'm like, yes, come tomorrow. I don't care. I don't have any appointment slots, but come in. I don't care if you never pay me money. Like I have a real passion for helping children who are dealing with pain. Um, and if, without diving too deep into this, quite frankly, the thing that I realize is so interesting that I don't talk about in public so much is that I also had trauma growing up as a child. And that is such a big piece of my pain that I don't discuss. You know, I think I went a certain route in my career um, where for a long time I treated these things as like tissue patterns. You know, people were not people were puzzles to solve, but people's pain was a puzzle to solve based on faulty mechanics or movement or posture or things like that. And it's not that I don't think those things play a role. I'm still in practice because I deeply believe in the work that I do um, as a rolfer. But for me, getting well was hugely about unpacking things that I had been through that of course I thought I had unpacked. <laughs> mm. And then I was well, like, oh, but it was like, <laughs> I know. The ever the unfolding endless journey. endless unpacking. <laughs> it's always, there's always fresh layers. Always. Yeah, so it's like that hubris of being young, right? In my early 20s was when my body really shut down. So I was in uh, college. It was my junior year of, of college. And I had always had pain. It was totally the same thing as the seizures. So when I was 10, I had a seizure and fell into the Christmas tree. It was like, this moment of the outside world acting so surprised by it that I was like, huh, is that a thing? Like, is that problematic? This is what's interesting about, to me, about birth injuries is that it's just who you are until the world tells you like, well, the rest of us aren't going through that. Mm -hmm. And so with pain, I was a junior in college and so I'm surrounded by all these young people in their late teens and early 20s. And um, my jaw locked shut. I couldn't open my mouth more than a couple of millimeters, like enough to squish a straw through and have some liquid food. I hadn't been able to turn my head to the right in years. 
Um, there were lots of days I couldn't put any weight on my right leg because the pain in my right sacroiliac joint was so severe. I didn't know that that's what it was at the time. And just like these awful recurrent dreams about having um, like a steel helmet bolted into my head and trying to take the steel. Like I just was living in a shit ton of pain. <laughs> and mm. it was this moment, my jaw locking shut and not being able to eat food in a normal way was concrete enough that I was like, huh. <laughs> seems like other people my age are not dealing with this so much. And that was um, the beginning of a wake-up call. It was the beginning of noticing something about reality that I had just called normal. Um, and it began a process of working with uh, doctors at the Tufts, at the time it was the Tufts TMJ Clinic, Temporal Mandibular Joint clinic for disorders of that joint. Now it's the Tufts, I think, orofacial pain clinic these days. But what a great clinic. It was at the time, God, one of the only places in the country that was, first of all, taking jaw disorders seriously. Second of all, not recommending the surgery, which was to, um, you know, saw off a portion of the mandible and replace it with basically you get a little titanium joint. The success rate for that surgery, I don't have the actual percentage, but was extremely low. And so, this clinic took a stance of like, well, if the success rate for this highly invasive surgery is low, why would we ever recommend it? And so, I'm really endlessly grateful that whatever it was, the big unseen hand put me in the stream of this clinic because um, I certainly was a candidate for surgery. I didn't have any jaw function. Um, and they also took a very holistic approach. So, what they did to actually get my bite working to get my jaw open again was to fit a series over a period of about a year and a half, a series of splints over my lower teeth that changed my bite incrementally. So, first of all, it's incremental, which is very kind and we don't do that in medicine that much. Um, it was not invasive. It was just something that fit on and off my lower teeth. And then they also did other things like they <laughs> realized hmm, like people who have jaw dysfunction <laughs> tend to have trauma and histories of mm. abuse. Maybe we could refer them to, you know, psychologists, maybe we could refer them to do a course of biofeedback, which I also did, which was the beginning of me noticing that I had a body that wasn't just pain, you know, that I could access my body and have some control, positive beneficial control of my body and positive beneficial experiences. Like, oh, I feel my fingertips getting warm. You know, because I was always so oriented towards noticing pain. It's so interesting how so many of us don't even realize the extent or the depth of what we're dealing with until you can be exposed to something new. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like on many, many levels, you were coping with a kind of suffering, some of which was unnecessary, some of which was symbolic and indicative. And yet you were doing it so much in isolation because you had no um, point of reference and no one else to really understand what was happening to you and give you tools or a different experience to see a new way. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel, I still feel so lucky and so grateful to that, that clinic and that time. And um, I worked with a doctor who's still in practice, Dr. Murad Padamsi big gratitude to you. <laughs> what a lovely, <laughs> lovely human being. And um, so, I worked with him for about a year and a half and I had a functioning jaw. I could eat food and open and close my mouth, but I still couldn't turn my head to the right. I still had really severe pain. I had done a course of physical therapy. I had done a course of biofeedback. I was doing <laughs> therapy. There were a lot of these things that they had referred me to, but I still just had tons of pain. And I'll never forget, he like gave me a sit down talk one day, very loving, gentle presence, this person. So, it had that quality to it. And he just said, Brooke, <laughs> if you're going to get better and stay better, you're going to need to do two things. Now, I love that shit. Like someone's going to give me this super concrete, like <laughs> here are your two <laughs> bullet points and you'll be perfect forever. <laughs> But what he said was, you're going to have to, and I look back on it now and I'm like, I can't believe that's what came out of his mouth all those years ago. He said, you're going to have to learn how to meditate <laughs> and you're going to have to get some really good body work. And like, those are the two things that have become 
everything that my life is about. Wow, which is dumb. so amazing. Like I'll never forget that moment sitting across from him and talking to him. And so um, because meditation seemed daunting and annoying. <laughs> Quite frankly. <laughs> I, start, I started tinkering with it in a very like, eh, eh. I'm going to like just jab at it from a long distance, like with a little pole that I pull. <laughs> but I, but body work, first of all, I was like, what is that when it's not a car? I had never heard about body work used outside of a car. I didn't grow up in a, you know, holistically minded household just because that wasn't a frame of reference we had. I didn't even know the whole field existed. I knew there was massage therapy because we all hear about spa vacations and stuff, but I didn't have any reference of it as therapeutic or something different than physical therapy. Um, so I did what I always do and I researched <laughs> every form of body work. <laughs> and I had a boyfriend at the time who gave me, cause this is back when people learned things from books <laughs> The year was oh, 1996, the year. I think, when he gave me this. He gave me a book, The Yellow Pages of Holistic Health. Great. Mm. Again, I love my good bullet points. And there was like the bodywork section. I'm like, awesome. I'm going to flip through the bodywork section and read about every form. And rolfing just sounded like what I needed. It. It's a terrible word. I still think it's a terrible word. God bless Dr. Rolf, but so annoying that they got named after her. But what it sounded like when they described it was that you might feel like someone's taking off the rusted suit of armor you've been living in. And if anyone felt like they were living in a locked up, rusted, awful suit of armor, it was me. So I was like, oh, all right, I'll do that. And um, found my way to a rolfer. And it was another one of those experiences where I remember pretty much in the first moments of the first session, that it was going to be, I don't know that I had such a clear articulation, like I'm going to be a rolfer, but it, that it was going to be a very important part of my life that I was going to follow that path. Wow. I think this is even the first time I've heard this story in, in so much detail, even though I understand certain aspects of your experience really well. And I guess what kept coming up for me is, of course, with bliss and grit, embodiment means so much to both of us. I mean, we talk about it nonstop, even off of the podcast. That's how geeky we are. <laughs> um, but I really was aware when you were talking about how much the body speaks like this idea that the body actually holds messages for us. It, it holds traumas, but in the traumas, it holds messages. It points our way. It's, it's telling us something. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder true. if you can share a little bit about that, about what you've noticed both personally and certainly as a practitioner for so many years now about how the body speaks to us. Ooh, I mean, there's so much to say there. It's, so rich. I would like if I'm going back to that moment in time when this was a new awareness, a new concept for me, that my body might be saying something worth listening to. And that it was, you know, throwing a temper tantrum because it had information to deliver that I was utterly ignoring and shutting out. Um, it's so simple. Like we're so straightforward in certain ways. And then we're so not straightforward in other ways. But in, in this case, back at that time, it's like my jaw was locked shut. <laughs> like, hello, like, is there something you're not saying? Is there some message you got about keeping your mouth shut? Is there some, just so straightforward and just the physical act of getting it open and then getting, uh, you know, to experience a pain-free body changed the way I related to the world. It changed the way I interacted. You know, I'm, what's coming up, what I'm thinking of is, um, so at the time I was at Rhode Island School of Design undergrad studying painting. So it was great because I had this practice to relate to painting every day because I've always been a workaholic. So anything I do, I'm pretty dedicated. <laughs> so <laughs> making lots of paintings all the time. And it's funny when my jaw was locked shut, I think I got, I wish I still had some of these around. I think I do, but I was making these tiny, like two inch by three inch paintings, <laughs> these little people in these huge overwhelming environments. So it'd be like this little person surrounded by all these big trees and bushes that were like kind of obscuring them. 
And it was a little bit of like a where's Waldo, where's that? Is that a person or is that a more of the bush? So it was like this very compact, tight uh, practice. And when my jaw got open, I didn't have any linear thought of like, you know what I'm going to do now is be <laughs> different. I'm like different. Opinion. But what happened was, I don't even know how it occurred. It's like I started buying, I started going to Home Depot and buying doors and um, hinging them together. So to have these giant panels to work on. And I started painting these huge people where it was just the person, no environment, tons of color, so much color, like really vivid co color. And they were super confrontational. Like they're always just staring directly out at the viewer. Mm. <laughs> really funny, right? Like, so that's something that it wasn't a thought, but something in me changed enough that like, what was my dominant expression at the time painting, like really reflected that that came from the body, like the body led that, um, and leads all these things. Like it just keeps yeah. unfolding. I don't know what's going to change when something changes in my body, but lots will. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, in psychology, many of you probably have heard about Freudian psychology, but in psychology at large, we often look to these things that we can store in the unconscious, right? Because so many times the things that we're stuck on or suffering with we rationally can understand what's happening to us and yet nothing seems to change from that level of analysis. So we start to go, well, what's in the subconscious? What's in the unconscious? What aren't we seeing? What are we believing that we take to be true, but we can't see it because it's like the air we breathe, right? So in typical Freudian psychoanalysis, they start to look at things like the dreams, yeah. right? Like, um, ticks, like behaviors that people do to try to go a little deeper and understand more your art, things like that. Mm -hmm. But in, in many psychological and also spiritual traditions, like in certain aspects of Buddhism, they recognize the body as the unconscious. The yeah. body is the unconscious to certain people and that it holds so much information for us to unpack and explore more about what we're dealing with, what we're capable of. And it can even give us almost like clues as to how we can begin to release. Yeah. I just want to say it again. The body is the unconscious mind. It mm. really is. And when you think about it as that tangible, still intangible in a certain way because it's unconscious, but um, it becomes so workable. You have this whole frame of reference to relate to. Well, what would you say? Let's say someone notices, okay, I have a tight jaw. I, I can't turn my neck. You know, any number of symptoms that some people listening may notice in their body, any kind of chronic tensions. How would you recommend someone began? Like, where did they even begin to explore this unconscious mind that lives within their body? I think it depends. I think there's a lot of routes. Um, and one of the reasons why I do liberated body is that there are a lot of paths to here, you know, so for me, Rolfing was an awakening process in it. And I was going to say in a certain sense, but in a very direct sense, um, for somebody else, maybe not so much, you know, maybe Alexander or Feldenkrais or yoga, but I would say, start doing something that allows you to have a relationship with your body. I mm. think we're so um, brain oriented and I'm specifically not saying mind oriented. We're so brain oriented because the mind is the body too. Um, it's so tempting to try and grab a hold of a thing. Like I could have sat down and gone, huh, my jaw is locked shut. Is this about repressed childhood trauma? Well, it could be about X and it could be about Y and it could be about Z. That's really interesting. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to think on that. I don't think anything would have changed with that approach. Maybe it would have, maybe, but I think it would have been very slow. And instead having this direct experience, in my case with Rolfing, this facilitator, right? I had a practitioner um, who I had a trusted relationship with. The actual, actually feeling my jaw, like I actually needed somebody to be touching me in that way so that I could feel myself. Mm. Um and that started things moving. So I would say just whatever intrigues you, the individual, 
as something that's going to allow you to cultivate a relationship with your body, just go there and make it really affectionate and not dogged at all. (laughs) Make it very like you're just kind of touching into the space, you know, just touching into because it's so easy to feel like, why is my, my jaw tight? Why can't I get rid of it? Like recently I've been having, I get, um, it's fun to put labels on things, costochondritis sometimes, but I've been having a, a little bit of like chest pains over the last year. Come and go here and there. It feels like deep in the chest. Um, you know, I did the doctor thing, like made sure I didn't have a heart problem, blah, blah, blah. And then once I realized that I'm somaticizing, I don't necessarily know about what. <laughs> and, again, and I could go like, what is this about? It's about I need to open my heart and it's because I'm in a new relationship and it's because of maybe, but like it doesn't matter. The thinking about it doesn't matter. So having an opportunity to, to feel what's going to allow you to have more access to f- feeling yourself without outcome attachments, you know, mm. like it'll go I'm, away or I'll have the answer. <laughs> I mean, we really can be in such battles with our bodies. It's ridiculous. And if I can feel tired, I'm almost like my body's betraying me. I have things to do. You know, right. we can be so unkind, never mind the judgments we can have about how we look and how we feel. I mean, it can go on and on. So I like that you highlighted a very warm approach I also noticed you talked a lot about like feeling and recovering a sense of feeling in your body and recovering numbness, recovering from tension. So can you say a little bit more about what that was like for you to begin to recover feeling and how that has shifted things for you in your life? I was just thinking about this because I just, as you know, um, but everyone listening doesn't know, I just got off retreat. So I just spent um, three days in retreat in the lineage that we practice in, in Dharma Ocean, um, their New York Sangha. And one of the teachers was talking about um, a student asked Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche once, what, what does bliss feel like? What is an experience mm. of bliss? And he said, great question. Oh, God, I know. <laughs> and he said to you, it would feel like pain. Wow. To most people, it would feel like pain. And I had, I don't know if you remember this, but when we, in, back in September, when we were in Crestone on retreat, I had this experience. Um, it's so funny how long it takes sometimes to just notice these things. So back in 1997, 98, uh, I had gone, was going through and had gone through rolfing. And I, for whatever reason, I got better pretty quickly. Like my pain receded very quickly. And my mobility came back very quickly. I think there was some part of me that was just really ready to do that work. And so then I had this body that was pain free, which freaked me the fuck out. And I didn't know it would because it was the goal. Like I'd achieved the goal pain free. Now I can get on with my life. And Instead, what happened is that it was um, terrifying and I started having anxiety attacks for the first time ever in my life. And it's like I had pain from uh, actual tangible injury. I had pain from somaticizing trauma stuff. Um, And it's like that got taken away so quickly that I couldn't quite adapt to it. But what was interesting is, uh, so it was back to the neurologist for me because I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe I was having a different kind of seizure pattern. It didn't feel like what people describe as anxiety attacks. It didn't feel like I had no fear feeling. I didn't have racing heart or panic or worry, sweating, none of that. It wasn't like that at all. What it was instead was this, <laughs> it was fun to explain this to neurologists. They all thought I was going crazy. I was like, it's just this really, 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 really big sensation, like almost like a ocean wave crashing of sensation through my whole body. And then the wave ebbs away and then another one comes. It's like this very overwhelming, uh, warm, tingling, just sensation everywhere. So I got labeled generalized anxiety disorder and given a prescription for Xanax and off you go. Um, then I come from a, you know, family pattern of addiction. So Xanax was, I knew wasn't going to be my jam. And actually that was when I got more serious about meditation and I wound up meditating my way to not having these attacks. But what happened is that when we were in Crestone in September, 
For the first time since that time, so now we're talking 2015, the very end of 2015, all those years later, I'm sitting for the first couple of days in that shrine room doing more long seated meditation than I ever have. And I start to have that feeling again for the first time in all those years of this big wave crashing through me. So my brain goes, "Uh uh-oh, I've triggered something that is a panic attack. Someone told me that's what it is. That's what's happening. I'm sitting in meditation. So probably some trauma shit's coming up for me. That's probably what's happening. And like that was the sort of mental chatter about it. And then we had been given the instruction as all are in meditation to just be with it. Like, can you make be, make a little space around it and just notice it? So I did that. I was like, all right, I'm, instead of deciding what this is and being nervous about it, I'm going to just make a little space around the sensation. And what happened after a while, it wasn't instantaneous, is that suddenly <laughs> it didn't feel at all scary. What it felt like was bliss, like this warm orgasmic, non-sexual orgasmic, undulating waves of exquisite bliss. And it was this crazy moment because I was like, oh my God, I labeled this thing a panic attack because I couldn't make space for it at that time. I just couldn't. I, I didn't. And so I guess I couldn't. And then when I had the ability to make space for it, I was like, holy shit, I was having bliss attacks. <laughs> <laughs> and I labeled them panic attacks. And I love when I heard that just a couple of days ago mm-hmm. that, you know, Rinpoche had said to you, it would feel like pain. I'm like, to me, it felt like pain. Mm-hmm. Being pain-free was so shocking. I experienced it. This bliss and a pain-free body is pain. So fascinating. I, I, I think there's probably a lot of levels to that. And, you know, a few that are popping out just as I'm listening is, one, we can become so identified with whatever we are doing or experience or thinking in such a way we're so confusing us humans. It's just <laughs> part of this rich human experience. But even in such a way where we can even become identified to our pain and feel very disoriented and not clear on who we are when that leaves. Absolutely. Because believe it, it comes with thoughts, it comes with feelings, it comes with behaviors, it comes with activities, you know, so all of a sudden that opens. Also, um, all sensations like bliss, joy, they can be overstimulating to a body. So if we have a body that has come to label stimulation as excessive or scary, as soon as we start to feel something, and I see this in my practice all of the time when I counsel people that they have a prohibition against happiness. Yeah. They have a prohibition against bliss because it's very, on some level, I imagine it's very prideful. It's very showy. I mean, it's crazy. But even though, you know, a lot of people feel vulnerable if they were to cry or if they were to feel sad in front of another human being, you should see how vulnerable people feel to be completely joyful. Yeah. Completely open and relaxed and joyful. Mm-hmm. So I also hear that level. And beyond that, I hear this idea that what happened is as you started to take off some of the tension and the armoring, you had access to this whole inner experience. Like it was just right there for you is how I'm receiving the story. And you took away the armoring and all of a sudden you just had feelings. Yeah. And, And those feelings weren't pain, which meant I didn't have my normal, comfortable reference point, familiar reference point. Gosh, it, it, it's interesting when you're listening and I and I wonder if any of you can relate to this personally, but we are so unbelievably fascinating that in a way most of us humans will cling to whatever is familiar versus step into something unknown even if the unknown could hold a, a much more rich and and beautiful possibility for us. Hell yeah, and that's the ongoing process. And there is the beautiful ongoing process. So um, I'm happy to hear you can have bliss attacks now. (laughs) (laughs) Bliss attack. 
<laughs> and, you know, as I said before, you and I can go on and on about the idea of embodiment. And I think we've been kind of skirting around it a little bit. We're taking away armoring, we're covering a sense of feeling. But I wonder if in your experience, you could share what do you mean when you use the word embodiment? Mm, yeah. <clears throat> what do I mean? I mean, I guess it's related to what I was just saying, like cultivating a relationship with your body, having the ability, I think we don't realize, I'll speak for myself and, and for what I see in most all of my clients, you know, in, in a 16 year practice is that most of us don't have much in the way of an experience of our own bodies. Which is why things like these practices, you know, receiving body work or having a Tai Chi practice or whatever, they give us opportunities to cultivate that relationship. And um, I, I think it's helpful to realize that we're in a culture that is very disembodied and that really throws the body on the trash heap of useless crap and treats it like a extra thing. Like, well, if I'm alive, I have to carry this meat bag around. <laughs> but what really matters are the important intellectual thoughts I'm having and the work I'm doing and whatever. Um, the real juiciness of life, the real opportunity to develop is an opportunity to get in your own body. And that's, uh, it's like any relationship. You know, it's, it requires constant attention and nourishment. Mm. Well, I know from my life that one of the reasons why I was not in my body and remember this isn't conscious, but one of the reasons why I had unconsciously fled up to the safety of my thinking mind and up to the safety of my fantasies was I had a lot of pain in my body and I mean, emotional I mean, memories, I mean, fears, I mean, grief, sadness, this, that, the other thing. Um, I wonder if you can share, what do you think the benefits of embodiment have been in your life? How, how has it opened you up? How has it changed how you relate in the world? Like, what shifted for you as you've learned how to relate to your body in a new way? Yeah. Uh, so it's very simple. I'll keep it simple. Um, the more I can be in my body, my life actually changes. Um, so that's a tricky thing to say, cause I don't want to make it sound like it's about grabbing the brass ring or that I have grabbed the brass ring and like, I, I got it. I'm on it. Cause it's a, a constant fucking, unfolding. <laughs> 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 um, but I do it. I don't do it because somebody told me it's a good idea. I don't do it to relax. I don't do it so I'll be more productive. I don't do it so I'll be nicer. I don't do it for any of those reasons because oftentimes those are not the things that occur. Mm. What I notice is that my life changes. I'm able to discover the places where I'm sleepwalking. Not perfectly and not all the time, but I get these little glimpses of me sleepwalking in ways that I didn't realize I was sleepwalking in the past. And those things become workable and sometimes painful, but also sometimes f funny, super hilarious. <laughs> and I don't know, life evolves. It's, it really is. Um, I don't mean to use like stupid corny term, but it's like, um, it is like I unkink a hose in myself and just this river of life can move through me and I'm not the one doing anything. Like I'm not the great Oz behind the curtain, which I think, you know, I certainly <laughs> have pretended to be the great Oz of my own life, you know, where I'm, I can fix things and make things happen. And it's just not like that. It's not like, oh, good. Then I can make all my goals come true. It's more like, I don't know what's going to bust up out of that soil. Um, but I know I want to be alive. I know how easy it is to be the living dead. <laughs> And I want to make space for that and to see how life is going to surprise me and to see what wants to come through that I wouldn't have even thought of in my little planning, goal setting, striving brain. Mm. 
I think we all really do crave aliveness. You know, I think actually that's the intrinsic drive when we feel like something's missing or when we feel empty. It's because we're not in a state of full aliveness. We're not in a state of full yes yeah. to, to life and to ourselves. And yesterday when I taught meditation, I was talking about that. Like, don't use meditation as a way to relax because if you have that goal, it's nice and it's pretty. It's, I'm not judging it at all. Like, we all have it. But if you use that goal, you can all too easily tranquilize yeah. instead of becoming alive. And instead, when you go into your body and you um, be present with, make space for whatever is coming, you develop the real capacity to be relaxed because it's real peace of mind because there's this knowing that you can be with everything, that there's nothing you have to kind of push down or you know, fancy up in a pretty ribbon in order to tolerate it. And I think otherwise, it's, it's amazing how much we will just sedate ourselves yeah. to deal with overstimulation, but then wind up kind of turning down the volume on all of the bliss and the goodness as well. Yeah. And, and I think what you're getting at is, or for me anyway, it's about cultivating this curiosity. Like, I wonder what's going to show up. I don't know. Like, I wonder what I'll discover. I wonder what's going to, like, I just, like I said, I just finished three-day retreat. And coming back from retreat is always this, like, oh, I wonder what'll show up. Not because it's all going to be wonderful, because as you know, I've come back from retreat and gotten the old two by four to the face. Like, that happens too. But it's so interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, just so you know, it is also everyone listening. Yes, it is. It is gritty. It does get gritty. I mean, that's, that's part of it. I don't know, Brooke, did you feel like it took you a while in your life to get to the place though, where you're like, this is fascinating. I got hit with a two by four in the face or <laughs> were you, you know, always holding that capacity? Because no. No. God, no. <laughs> And it's a constant leading edge of my learning. It's not, I never sit down and I'm like, wouldn't it be great if something really horrible happened today that just opened up a, a learning experience. fresh perspective? I hate that shit, you know, but, but when it gets served up, I guess what's changed is my capacity to meet it, you know, yeah. and, and to meet it in a different way. So, and I think also the delusional fantasies that we would get to live without it have faded away, right? So there comes a certain level of maturation that develops when you keep staying present and you keep staying aware, you develop this level of maturation that says, okay, look, this is how life is. If we are going to make space for the bliss, if we're going to make space for genuine presence and aliveness and connection some of this other stuff is going to come with it. So. Yeah, they come together. And it's not because there's a failing in my practice, or in me, or in any of those things. It's just that's the human journey. We had talked about meditation a lot. We've talked about Dharma Ocean and our lineage and our retreats. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about how you think embodied meditation, or we can also call it a somatic meditation, how you think it is involved in a spiritual path? Well, I'll talk a little bit about my experience with meditating. So as I mentioned, it was way back in 96 when I had this doctor say, you're going to need to learn to meditate. Um, and so what I did first was decide that I would get better at goal setting. <laughs> <laughs> And call it meditation because I liked that better. I did that so for easier. maybe a decade. <laughs> so, and I still do it. Um, but back then I actually called it meditation. <laughs> and then, and then I started playing around with very simple vipassana. Sit down, notice when you have a thought. And when you notice you have the thought, just compassionately say thinking and let the thought go. I hated it so much. I felt like I was putting myself, the, the old line in the matchbox thing. I felt like I was putting myself in a cage. Um, and for a long time, years, I told myself that's what meditation was. And that it's because I have monkey mind and it's because I need to harness my monkey mind and it's because I need to empty my mind. And um, so there was this sort of like flagellating way of making my way through that kind of meditating. 
And it, meanwhile, this whole time I'm a rolfer and I engage in an awful lot of movement practices. Um, and it was on the podcast that I started discovering people on Liberated Body and my other show who were taking this really somatic approach to meditation. And um, it was you who saw me doing that. And you got in touch with me and you said, you got to check out Reggie Ray. And I was like, I know, so many interesting people, super busy. You know, and I kind of blew it off for a while. <laughs> That'll learn you. <laughs> um, and then I got on the Dharma Ocean site and I listened to the, I wasn't looking for a, a teacher. I just found it interesting that people were talking about getting out of the cage of your own thinking by getting into your body. Because that made sense to me because I'm a body person. And then I, you know, when I heard the first time Reggie teaching, just listening to a recording off of their website, um, it was totally one of those lightning bolt moments where I just started weeping out of nowhere. And I was just like this. It was just that utter feeling of like this, this. And that wasn't even meditating with him. It was just listening to him talking about the view. Um, and I started doing the practices, which on one level, some of the opening practices, 10 points practice felt a lot to me like Alexander technique. Like how do I get inside my own body and release all these micro pockets of, of tension? Um, and then of course the practices get evolve from there. There's a lot of somatic practices in Dharma ocean. Um, and what I noticed, what I, what I did initially is I signed up for a month long online course to go through practices, to commit to 15 minutes a day. Um, which felt like a lot at the time. That's why I'm giggling to commit to 15 minutes a day. Uh, and they were the somatic heart opening practices. And I thought, Oh, this will be nice. <laughs> and then what happened is that, um, my heart started to open and what that felt like was like walking around in the world, like a big raw open wound. And I was like, Oh, like shit, something's actually happening here. So that was the beginning of me realizing for me, when I have a somatic meditation practice, what I was saying before, life changes, things start happening. And so I dove into a more in-depth program because I felt like I needed to not feel like an open wound walking around the world and I needed more support in my practice, which I got. Um, and that was extremely helpful and continues to be. Um, and it was funny because it, it, I mean, basically it all just brought me back around to exactly where I spend my whole career life, which is the body is the way. <laughs> so funny how simple we are. Huh? The body is yeah, the way. It's, it's amazing when we look back at the themes in our life, we're like, oh, crap. I've been thinking the same thing for a million years. Like, why couldn't I have just executed? Yeah, and I have just gotten that. <laughs> gotten that right away. <laughs> 16 years ago, 18 years ago, whatever. <laughs> One thing that, you know, I just want to kind of wrap this up with because it's been on my mind as we're talking and we're talking about embodiment so beautifully is um, since you are also a movement educator and you've worked with so many people and you've been here personally, many, many people exercise and yet you would still say many of them are disembodied. And I don't think that that always makes sense right away. You know, someone can have a yoga practice and be disembodied. How can that happen? And I wonder if you can just share your thoughts on that for people to kind of start to work with. I think that um, in our culture right now, exercise is one of the dominant ways that we disembody, um, which is super interesting because people think they're attending to their body Hmm. It's the opposite of having a relationship with your body, right? It would be like if I were in a love relationship and the way I treated my partner <laughs> was to say, was to completely not, never listen to them, never ask them a question, <laughs> never engage with them, but tell them what to do. You're going to wake up. You're going to eat this for breakfast. You're going to go to work. Yeah, but, but no, 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 no. You don't talk to me. <laughs> I talk to you. <laughs> so it's like that one-sided, aggressive, hateful, controlling relationship, which mm. would never last up because I pray that there's nobody on planet Earth who would stick around for a relationship that 
clearly that lacked reciprocity, but we do that with our bodies all the time. Um, and we even glorify it. Like the person at the gym who is having all this knee pain and they have elbow tendonitis, but they're showing up because they're dedicated. Mm. Like, yeah. No pain, no gain. Fuck are you working on your body when it hurts that much? Like, w- <laughs> And I'm not saying there's something wrong with them because they have pain, because I still deal with pain that comes and goes. Um, but it's like, why are you engaging with it in this aggressive way where it's like, no, 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 thank you. I don't want to hear what you have to say. I also don't want you to give you any opportunity to heal or thrive or function differently or tell me what I might need, might need to know about my functioning. I'm going to control it and I'm going to do. It's this aggressive doing as opposed to relating. Um, so we can, I'm sure unpack that in a whole other, in a whole yeah. episode, but um, I'm say. a big advocate for that. But like, and it's not to say that you can't do something that looks a lot like exercise and make it movement. You know, so today I was, I, I train in, um, move nat. That's my practice mostly physically. Um, and the woman who, um, does my programming for me, who's a move nat trainer, Marini, who's lovely. Hi, Marini. She was having me do cleans with a barbell. I love throwing around heavy things. So that's not a problem for me. I could easily have made that very aggressive or I can tune in and like notice that like for whatever reason, it was making my orthostatic pressure go batshit crazy today. And I would just like get really low blood pressure when I did a clean. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I could, I could just keep doing them. And at a certain point I was like, no, no. I'm going to instead slow way, 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 way down and do this as a very from the inside out um, deadlift practice. And then I learned a lot about my body, where I am, (laughs) that I'm tired today and that's okay. (laughs) You know, so it's, it's not even necessarily about like what it looks like on the outside. It's just, are you doing it as a relationship? Are you relating to your body or are you pushing it around? Mm, Well, I think that's a very good description. And I would bet that gives people actually a lot to think about. And I also think you're right. We probably can and should unpack that over many different episodes. And I just can't wait to hear more from you about how people can be more liberated in their bodies. It was really cool even to get to learn something new about a friend I've had for over 15 years now. So thank you for sharing. Is there anything, Brooke, that you would like to share to feel complete as we bring this to a close? I'm sorry that my lawn guys just showed up. (laughs) I don't know if anyone can hear it. I just heard someone fire up the weed whacker. Um, Maybe you can't hear it. Um, But more importantly than that, I'm really excited. I've always felt like there's... um, a certain m- magic in the way that we relate and really care about these topics. So I'm excited to be doing this in a more public place. We'll see what it, see what seeds push up through the soil. Well, thanks for sharing with us and thanks for tuning in to bliss and grit. On behalf of both Brooke and myself, we want to thank you for listening to this week's episode of bliss and grit. As I said in the beginning, the first two episodes, we did an interview style format because we thought it would be fun and useful for you to get to know Brooke and myself and where our thoughts and our feelings and point of views are coming from. In the upcoming episodes, you'll have a lot more conversation as we explore everything that we've learned and everything that we're still struggling with and wondering about on this path of being modern spiritual practitioners. If you want to follow along with us more closely, please feel free to go to blissandgrit.com. That website will be evolving weekly as we get our stuff together. And you can also find us on social media. We're on Facebook at Facebook forward slash Bliss and Grit, as well as Instagram and Twitter at the Bliss and Grit handle. Of course, weekly, you can find us releasing our podcasts on Tuesdays on iTunes and Stitcher. If you have any feedback you'd love to share with us or any thoughts, any questions, um, even any topics of interest, we would love to have that. So just feel free to share that on any medium that is most comfortable for you. And we're looking forward to getting to know you more and hoping that you'll continue to join us as we 
fumble our way through the spiritual path in today's modern society. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week on Bliss and Grit.